Welcome everybody and thank you for attending another virtual session of the U3A here in Hermanus. Admiral Johan Retief is the former head of the South African Navy and I am sure many of you will recall the fascinating lectures he has given us about naval incidents and some of the activities on sea. He is also a very keen amateur astronomer and very active in the local astronomy society in Hermanus. And both the Astronomy Society and the U3A have both benefited from some of the wonderful lectures that he has given us. They are always very well researched. So today's presentation on the future moon landing will be equally interesting. And Johan, thank you for your preparation, and we're certainly looking forward to it. Thank you, Ger. The subject of going to the moon is very interesting. For me personally, when the first landing on the moon took place, I was sitting on top of a mountain on Gough Island in 1969. And when Aldrin said the moon looked desolate, well, it looked desolate from where I sat as well. Today, we're gonna to talk about returning to the moon in 2024. And my intention is to take us back a bit into the past. I will talk about the Apollo program we will look at the moon to think of certain factors affecting the moon. We will look at the Artemis program, and then we look at the future. As you all know, Apollo and Artemis in Greek mythology were twins. Apollo is the god of the sun, and Artemis the god of the moon. Here you see Aldrin on the right, and uh, the photograph was taken by Neil Armstrong who is reflected in the helmet of Aldrin over there is Neil Armstrong and his shadows over here. And this is then also the first selfie that was taken on the moon. It all started with John F. K., who in 1961 stated that the United States as a national goal for the 1960s was landing a man on the moon and returning him safely to the moon. This was the start of the lunar, of the Apollo program, and it was a clear statement. The same year, the Marshall Space Flight Center was established in Huntsville, Alabama, from where the development was guided. The director appointed at the time was Dr. Dr. Werner Magnus Maximilian Freyer von Braun appointed in July 1960 as the director, and he also is the architect of the Apollo program. Uh, as you all know, von Braun was a Nazi and is one of those who, under Operation Paperclip, was rescued from Germany at the end of the war. The mainstay of the project was the Saturn V rocket, this is an artist's rendition of what it looked like. The lead contractors for the rocket was Boeing, North American Aviation, Douglas Aircraft Company, and IBM to handle the software. At the time, the computers were very young, and I don't think they were as good as a normal cell phone computer, uh, but they worked well. Of the Saturn V rockets, a total of 16 rockets were built. 13 of them flew, numbers 8, 10, 11, 11 to 17 went around the moon. Number 18 that flew was in fact, became Skylab, uh, and I will cover that at the later stage. The command and service module was the bit that the crew sat in, they were confined to this capsule, and this was the module that provided the propulsion, fuel, power, and everything else. The mission's durations were 8.2 days in the case of the Apollo 11 mission, and the longest was 12.5 days in the case of the last mission. What is important, of course, is you will ask me about Apollo 13, that's the mission that failed, because an oxygen tank inside the 
service module, blew a massive hole in the module, and the crew, in fact, had to shift into the lunar lander to use that as a lifeboat, and the duration of that mission was only six days. They went to the moon, went around it, and came straight back again. Time spent on the moon, well, it's different. The Apollo 11, the first one, spent 21 hours on the moon. And they were at EVA, is the abbreviation, and there's lots of acronyms in this presentation, for extra vehicle activity. EVA was 2.5 hours. So poor Armstrong and Aldrin only had 2.5 hours on the ground. On the right, you can see the lunar lander. It's the, uh, known as the LM landing module. It consists of two pieces. The actual landing or descent stage, and then the ascent stage. At the end of the mission, the astronauts climbed back into the ascent stage, and it had its own rocket and blew off from the descent stage to return to the service module, which was in orbit around the moon. Also to remember is the lander did not have an airlock. So every time you left the lander, you in fact had to get dressed in your spacesuit, pump out all the air that you can, open the doors, and open the lander to space. What was important, as was said to the one guy, please don't shut the door. It doesn't have a handle on the outside. So going, climbing back in was important. These numbers in brackets behind the EVAs is the number of EVAs. What is interesting is that in this case of Apollo 15, they did stand up EVAs. They, in fact, opened the thing, stood up, and surveyed the area before they got out. But even the longest stay, Apollo 17, only stayed 22 hours on the ground action. Where did they land? I think it's important to look at the moon and just find out where they landed. Apollo 11 landed in what was known as Mare Tranquillitatis. Now, for those who may not know, the dark areas were considered to be seas, and the light areas considered to be highlands and dry lands. This specific uh, dark area was called, is called Mare Tranquillitatis. Apollo 12 and landed in this large area known as Oceanus Procellarium, which is the sea of storms. Number 13 did not land. Number 14 landed close by in Mare Cognitum. Number 15 landed next to this mountain reef called and next to a donga known as next to Rafaias Mountains. Number 16 down on the highlands at the Descartes Highlands. And number 17 at the Taurus Litro Valley. This Rafes Montes, they in fact landed next to the Hadley Row, and I will show you that in the later stage. In 2009, a satellite was put in orbit around the moon, known as the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter. It is still there, and its main job is photographing the moon. It is fitted with a camera, and so if you see the words, L Rock, it stands for Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter Camera, and we will refer that quite a lot. If you later open your computer and you look at quickmap.lrock.asu.edu, you will see a mosaic of all the photographs taken by the orbiter of the moon. And it gives you the ability to click on this button, put in the latitude and longitude, and it will show you where you are on the moon. I have done so for some of the landers. Just to orientate ourselves, the moon is the north, the west, east, and the south pole, 
and these are by convention. It's easy to remember. Of the seas, this one over here is called Mare Crisium, the Sea of Crises, in Afrikaans, the Rampa Sea. Now, by convention, all the crises always comes from the east, even if it's corona viruses. So, the sea is easy to identify when they make it up. That's east. North is over there, and there is one crater over here, oh, you can just see it over there, a war plane called Plato. In the west, there's another war plane called Grimaldi. And then in the south, you have the crater of Tycho with its rays, which is easily visible with the binoculars. Now, from a minus, it doesn't look like that because we see the moon upside down. Although we think that other people actually see the moon upside down. Once again, Mare Crisium is in the east. So when you look up, you will see Mare Crisium on your west, on your left. There is Tycho with its rays of ejecta, which is very clearly visible in your binoculars. That shows where south is. Grimaldi, west, and Plato is nice and clear visible with that. It's in the north. Here I've gone to the landing site of Apollo 11. I've used the program to find the site, and it's indicated by my little cursor over there. That actually is the landing part of the landing module. You can see its shadow right next to it. Others are more impressive. Here I've got Apollo 12. Now Apollo 12 had of all Navy crew. Uh, this is an, a really interesting one. You can see a lander once again. I've put my cursor next to it there. And you can see here the tracks of the astronauts as they walked around the area. That little white dot over there is known as the ARSEP, the old SAP. It is the acronym for Apollo Lunar Surface Experiment Package, which they parked over there. They walked around this hill over here, and from over here, they took another photograph. And what is important is if you look here, this little white thingy over here, and you can see the shadows are all on the left. That thing is in fact Surveyor 3, a lander that was launched in 1967 and has been recording various things in preparation for the Apollo program. This is the only case where people from Earth has visited something that was sent up into the sky and landed on another celestial object. During the landing, Alan Bean took a photograph from approximately over here, showing his friend, the Conrad, standing next to the lander and showing the landing module in the background. Here's Conrad standing. This is the Surveyor 3 with its feet. In the background is the landing module. Here you can see the Concertina arm of the Surveyor 3 with its scoop for scooping up samples. And what they did was they disconnected certain bits and pieces of the lander to take back to do analysis of how much corrosion actually took place while it was up there. How much erosion, I think it's a better word. What is also interesting is to watch and have a look at the spacesuit of Conrad. They say the moon dust is quite clinging, fine, and actually quite abrasive. We obviously knelt somewhere because it's stuck to it. Next slide, it's the last one I will show you of the moon surface of the people on it, is Apollo 15. 
there's the lander over there. That white dot, we all now know, is the OSEP. Apollo 15 was the first lander that took a lunar mobility unit with it. The lunar mobility unit is also known as the moon buggy. And when they left, they left the moon buggy, and you can see it on the ground over there. It's probably full of parking tickets by now. The next photograph is the one I showed you right at the beginning. Here's James Irwin standing next to the boom buggy. And here you have the Hadley roll. And I don't know what the nice word for roll in English is. Uh, donga, ravine. It also gives you an idea of the size of the land of the moon buggy. Apollo 1, at the end of the Apollo program in 1972, is September when Apollo 17 came back. Uh, a good question for your quiz would be, who was the first man on the moon? And the answer is Neil Armstrong. Then your next question would be, who was Eugene Cernan? The obvious answer is, he was the last man on the moon. Apollo 1 is mentioned over here because maybe you can remember 1967. Apollo 1 was carrying out training and tests when they started the fire in the command module and all three astronauts killed. Now that stopped the program for something like 22 months while they did boards of inquiry and they made some changes to the design. The problem they had was that they used pure oxygen as the atmosphere in the lander, and of course that's quite dangerous. Also, they made the door so that it couldn't be easily opened from the outside. So when the fire started, the people outside couldn't get the door open. That was changed. Apollo 18 and 19 were canceled due to financial constraints. And Apollo 20 was launched to take the place, to place the Skylab into orbit. And here's a, a Arthur's rendition of the Skylab. This front bit, in fact, is the third stage of one of the rockets, which was rebuilt as a laboratory and habitation uh, module. It has uh, the command module and service module tied to it of Apollo 12, which launched it in, as a, a, a part of the rocket. And the Skylab project lasted for a period of 24 weeks. And in 1979, Skylab deorbited itself. The idea was to drop it in the Pacific, but some of the bits and pieces fell on Australia. Nobody was injured and no kangaroos killed. Let's look at the moon and let's do some thinking because we've got to think about landing on it in the future. Its distance from Earth is between 326,000 to 406,700 kilometers. 362,000 is perigee when it's closest to the Earth. It obviously has elliptical orbit around the Earth. 406,000 is apogee. Main ra mean radius of the moon 1,700 kilometers, Earth's radius 6,378. So it's about a quarter of the radius of the Earth. People sometimes ask, why is the moon not considered to be a planet and be part of a binary planet system with the Earth? And the answer is, by definition, to be a biplanetary system, the common center of gravity of the two bodies must be somewhere between the two of them and not inside one of the bodies. In the case of the Earth and the Moon, the common center of gravity is in fact inside the Earth, a certain number of kilometers below the Earth's surface. Now the Moon is actually going away from the Earth at the ear-shattering speed of three centimeters a year. Eventually it will be so far away that firstly there will be no complete solar eclipses anymore, and also the common center of gravity will move away from 
the Earth's surface. And then by definition, it will become a binary planet system. There is one binary planet system in, in our uh, solar system. Pluto and its moon Charon is of the size that the common center of gravity is outside Pluto. But Pluto is being demoted to a dwarf planet. Escape velocities on surface gravity, surface gravity of the moon is 1.62 meters per second square. It's one sixth of that of the Earth. That means if you mass is 90 kilograms on Earth, up there it's only 15 kilograms. Escape velocity from the moon, 2.38 kilometers per second. From the Earth, 11.2 kilometers per second. So taking off from, from the moon is not a problem. Length of the lunar day is 28.5 Earth days. It means that every 28.5 Earth days, the moon rotates around its axis once. Daylight time on the moon is 14 Earth days with a maximum temperature of 127 degrees Celsius, which is problematic. You have to have good cooling systems. Night time, it's about 14 Earth days long, it's also. But the money, minimum temperature on the dark side of the moon is minus 173 degrees Celsius. It's chilly. And of course, we are on the dark side, you cannot generate solar power, which is a problem. It's one of the issues that needs to be addressed when you consider a way to land. Atmosphere on the moon is negligible. There's no weather, no wind, no dust storms, no clouds, no aero braking of spacecraft, no parachutes. So you have to do propulsive landings using your rockets to stop you. There's no protection against meteoroids. In the case of the Earth, the meteoroids, many of them just burn up in the atmosphere. And of course, free water will disappear immediately. Magnetic field of the moon is negligible. There's no magnetic compass. There's no protection against solar radiation or cosmic rays. The first, the compass is a problem because navigation is a problem. And of course, in the moon, the horizon is very close to you because it is a small sphere compared to the Earth. And the possibility of picking up a GPS system for the moon is something that needs seriously to be considered. The protection against solar radiation and cosmic rays is a big problem. And they would probably have to dig in on the moon in the, in the lunar base. The lunar surfaces, the dark areas, like dark areas over here, consist of basalt or volcanic rock covered with dust. The light areas, is called a regolith, and it's made in dust, sand, and rocky debris. This very nice photograph, and it's very nice because I took it. I saw the moon in the last quarter. You can see the important uh, craters very clearly. There's Plato, the world plane. There's Eratosthenes, Copernicus, Kepler, and Aristarchus. These guys were all famous astronomers. Aristarchus, 200 years before Christ, was a Greek who worked out that the planets actually revolve around the sun. Uh, nobody believed him. Important also is the sea over here is Mare Umbrium, the sea of rain, and this bay over here is Sinus Iridum, the Rainbow Bay. Once again, Aristarchus is a strange uh, crater because it's very light colored. It's a fairly young crater. If you look at the crescent moon, and this part is dark, through your binoculars, you can actually see the crater in Earth shine, crater of Aristarchus. Right, another nice photograph of the moon, also taken by me. This is the first quarter moon. And here 
you can see Mari Christian quite clearly. Mari Tranquilitatis, Mari Serenitatis. But we talk now about the Constellation program. After Apollo, this was the next program to start. It was under the guidance of President George W. Bush. The Constellation program was established to guide NASA from 2005 to 2009. The major goals were the completion of International Space Station, which started in 2000, to return to the Moon, a mission to Mars, increase in astronaut experience beyond LEO is low Earth orbit, development of related technologies, building a spacecraft called Orion spacecraft blocks one, two, and three. Block one was a low Earth orbit spacecraft and two and three were beyond low Earth orbit spacecrafts. RS-1 was the rocket to take Orion up there. RS-1 was the low Earth orbit and RS-5 was the lunar orbit rocket. This ran well till 2009, and then a new president was appointed. He canceled the program in 2011, but the development of the space launch system and the Orion capsule continued to replace the space shuttle. Ladies and gentlemen, the American president and what his own wishes are have a major effect on NASA. Normally, with the appointment of a new president, a new administrator of NASA is also appointed. NASA, of course, being the National Aeronautics and Space Agency. Then in 2017, a new president was appointed. You may recognize him on the right. He issued Space Policy Directive Number One. And this policy directive included a lunar mission on the pathway to the future and to lead to the exploration of Mars. I like the new president. He's got firm decisions and a clear sight of the future in space. The Artemis program was established and so its clear goals. Landing the first woman and the next man on the moon. The landing should specifically be at the South Polar region and we'll get to that. And it should be by 2024. That is, if he is elected again, that is the last uh, year of his next tenure as president. NASA intends achieving these aims with the following partners. ESA, European Space Agency, JAXA, the Japanese Space Agency, CSA, Canadian Space Agency, ASA, Australian Space Agency, and such United States commercial space flight companies as may be contracted by NASA. And here you can see Artemis symbol for their program. The Orion spacecraft is known as a multi-purpose crew vehicle MPCV. And here's a breakdown of the whole thing. This over here is the capsule in which the crew travels. The crew module is built by Lockheed Martin, and this is known as the European Service Module, built by Airbus. It's designed to support a crew of six on a period of 21 days beyond low Earth orbit. In other words, it can go to the moon. And right on top is the launch abort system. This thing of the bomb has the job of putting the capsule clear of the rocket in case something goes drastically wrong during the launch. And once the rocket is cleared the atmosphere, this launch abort system is flown off and taken away along the part of the sea. The space launch system is the 
name of the new rocket, and here's an artist's condition of what it looks like. Boeing is the main contractor for the core stage, and the core stage is this reddish thing, and the turbines run a lot of the uh, tank on the space shuttle, and it is the same technology. Northern Drummond builds the solid fuel side boosters that will assist in taking the sea off the ground. These are the same boosters as they use on the space shuttle, but instead of four segments, they have five segments in it now. Give it a longer burn time. The first test flight of the space launch system, Artemis 1, is scheduled for November 2021. The first crewed mission of the space launch system, known as Artemis 2, is scheduled for August 2023, and will be a lunar flyby and a return to Earth to test the system on an orbit of the Moon. The capsule is designed to land in the sea, rather like the old Apollo capsule did, and like SpaceX's Crew Dragon capsule still does today. A major player in the Artemis system is CLPS. CLPS is the acronym for Commercial Lunar Payload Services. And their job is to support future Artemis missions. Okay, human landing system. NASA has decided they're going to contract this out. They've called for proposals, and three proposals have been um, accepted for further development. The lucky contractors are Blue Origin and its partners. Blue Origin belongs to a chap called Jeff Bezos, who's in charge of uh, Amazon.com. And this is the integrated human landing system that Blue Origin is chasing. He's got a lot of people in supporting in, in this development. There you can see the concept is the same. You have an ascent stage and a descent stage. SpaceX and Dynet Dynetics are the other two contractors that have been selected for further development. SpaceX is an organization that built Tesla motor cars and belongs to a chap called Elon Musk, who was born in Victoria. Dynetics is the Sierra Nevada Space Organization. This is SpaceX's Starship new landing system, and this is Dynetics' idea of what a landing system will look like. Now, both these two will, the whole landing system will return to the capsule, which is flying around the moon. This one is designed on the left to have two further fuel tanks, which are drop tanks, which they throw off once they empty. And these are very large solar arrays to catch the sun. In the case of Starship, it's a derivative of the Starship that they're designing at the moment. The Habitable area of volume of this ship can shift 100 tons or up to 100 people up there. It's designed with rockets on the side. Of course, it also has rockets underneath it, but these rockets will be used for landing purposes. They are concerned with the abrasion that will take place of the regular of the rockets blasting away below, and that it may produce an effect of removing soil and creating a, a hole for them to land in, which they don't want. Also, the exit from this rocket is fairly high up, and they are designing a hoist system or a lift system to bring the air on boats and the vehicles down there. The whole ship from Star, uh, SpaceX will return to the Orion spacecraft. 
Now, what is important is to note that there's no atmosphere up there. So these vehicles are not built for aerodynamic flight. This one is because this will actually leave the Earth. But it has no wings and it has no tiles to protect it against the atmosphere because the intention is that once it has flown, it will stay up in the sky, it will not come back. SpaceX is working towards a replenishment system to refuel the Starship once it's in orbit around Earth. But that's in some years to come. And now I'm going to talk about the Lunar Gateway. And here is an artist's picture of a Lunar Gateway. The original plan was that the Lunar Gateway will be placed in a near rectilinear halo orbit around the Moon. Okay, now here's a picture. There's the Earth. There's the Moon. There's the Gateway in an orbit. And it's near rectilinear because the plane of this orbit is 90 degree to the plane of rotation between the Earth and the Moon. The idea being that the gateway will always be in sunlight and always be not blanked out for communication between the Earth and the gateway. The plan says that the upper Moon is 7,000 kilometers and peri Moon will be about 1,000. And the orbital period for the gateway will be every seven days. Now the idea is that the gateway will, be, gateway will be in the form of a small space station from where the astronauts can stage landings on the moon. Orion will transport astronauts between the Earth and the gateway, and the selected landers will transport astronauts between the moon and the gateway. It's actually very clever. However, however, and this is the problem, the gateway cannot be built between now and 2004. It will take them at least eight years to build the gateway and to put it up in orbit to be used as a gateway. The current date is somewhere around about 2008. And it's important for Americans to do their moon, lunar landing before somebody else gets there. So they want to add land before the end of 2004. Where to land? This is a map of the lunar southern hemisphere. The intention is to land at the South Pole in a tiny crater named for Sir Ernest Shackleton. I have zoomed out on this thing, and here you can see the Shackleton crater um, with the South Pole actually inside the crater. And the crater is 21 kilometers in diameter and four kilometers deep. Now, why is this crater important? The point is that this rim of the crater is nearly always exposed to sunlight. And the bottom of this crater is always hidden from sunlight. So it is freezingly cold down there. And this is where they hope to find water in solid ice format, where it can be mined and taken up to the landers in the future. And the concept is that the lunar bodies and the landers will be somewhere on the rim of this small crater. Okay, now the Artemis 3 has been amended because of the time constraint. They must conduct the first landing before the end of 2024. To construct and deliver the lunar gateway within this time frame is possible, and the landing will be conducted without the gateway. Clips, commercial lunar pilot services, will pre position the lander in a local, in a lunar orbit, and O'Brien will dock of the lander. Uh, it's called the Lunar Orbit Rendezvous, LOR. And Orion will remain in the orbit until the lander returns. Four astronauts will cook, 
through the Orion for Artemis three, but only two will land. They will be the first woman and the next man. See, clips will preposition various other elements. For example, they will put the lunar mobility unit, the moon battery, on the moon close to the landing site. They will put various other bits and pieces that may be needed, possibly a power unit to charge the buggy, a habitability unit, even possibly a fuel cell for the lander. Now it's been stressed that this is not a flag and footsteps mission on the moon. Primarily the crew will have to do a reconnaissance of the area for a future moon base and as to the availability of water in the crater and other minerals in the area. Now if you go and read up on, into, on Wikipedia on Artemis 3, the whole landing and the task they would be down there for seven days has already been planned in gory detail. Of course, a lunar base is also planned to be established there in the area of Shackleton, where it will be visible to sunlight, and the temperature is far more moderate than on the dark or the sunny side of the moon. We have to think somewhat about the future. This is also a very nice photograph. It was taken by myself. Here you can see future targets for exploration. Mars, and in this case, Mars is overexposed because I wanted to catch two other possible targets, the dwarf planet Ceres and the large asteroid Vesta. Ceres is the next closest target after Mars for man to go to, as is Vesta. Then comes targets like the moon Europa, that is considered to be a liquid moon orbiting Jupiter, and the moon Titan. Here on the top left hand, you have a star. This is far too far away for us ever to go to. But that is the star Spica, also known as Alpha Virginis. It just happened to be in my photograph. I used Spica and Mars to be able to frame this photograph to catch Square Star and Ceres. Now, if one can talk about traveling to stars, it is important to realize that the closest star is the star Proxima Centauri. And it has exoplanets that we could visit. It is about four light years away. At the moment, we've got two satellites or spacecraft moving away from Earth, Voyager 1 and Voyager 2. And Voyager 1 is moving at the air splitting speed of about 15 kilometers per second. What is also important is to know that if at that speed you want to go to Proxima Centauri, it would take you 200 centuries, 20,000 years to get there. If we could increase our speed of travel to 2% of the speed of light, we would be traveling at 2,000 kilometers per second, which means that it would take us less than three minutes to get to the moon and less than about 18 hours to get to Mars. At that speed, 2,000 kilometers per second, it will still take us 200 years to get to Proxima Centauri. And this is a major problem because very few of us live that long. Freezing people doesn't work if we can only freeze half a person these days. Working on the concept of a generation ship, where a spaceship travels for 200 years, 
it will take probably about five generations to get to the other side. Conceptually, such a spaceship will be crewed of women only, with a massive sperm bag built into it. And they will regenerate themselves as they travel, making sure that they select red top sperm only for the trip and only collect the blue top ones when they get close to the target. But that's not our problem at the moment. I thought about the generation ship. And the whole concept came clear to me when many years ago I visited France. And I went to a little village called Mer. Because that's the village my ancestor left in 1687 to come to South Africa. Uh, I visited my colleague who was chief of the French Navy at the time, and he arranged for me to speak to the village historian. And he told me, he said, you must remember that you guys you left, we haven't kept any record about you, we don't know about you. As far as we're concerned, you don't exist. And suddenly I realized that if you, we, I was in a generation ship, and my generation ship has already been traveling for more than 300 years. In fact, I'm the ninth generation in South Africa. So the concept is not strange. For the people who stay behind, they just forget about the ship. We don't worry about them. When they come back, it will be a surprise. Ladies and gentlemen, thinking about generation ships, I end my talk. I used a very wide bibliography, Wikipedia, many, many uh, pages. NASA websites. Forrest Haggerty is the person who explains how the Apollo moon landing sites can be found on the L Rock website. And you know, in 1969, when this happened, I was on Gulf Island. And I've been married for two months, and my very wise wife bought me the copy of Scope of 8 August 1969. And that's what it looked like. The whole scope was just about the moon landings. And at the time, you can see the price, it was 15 cents. Ladies and gentlemen, and now I'm open for questions. Excellent, Johan, thank you very, very much. And thank you once again for all your research. Can you just repeat something? You talked about 2004 and 2008. I assume you, you meant 2024 and 2028. Why? Absolute apologies. I meant 2024 and 2028. I made a mistake. I my apologies. Just another question. Once they have completed the first landing, what is the intention? Is there any idea of the program beyond the first landing? The answer to that is yes, there is a program. In fact, if you go to uh, Wikipedia, they will give you all the Artemis numbers and what the intention is of them. But this is still very far away. Uh, obviously, Trump's election as the next president has a lot to do with what might happen. I think it's important to keep in mind that people like SpaceX is trying to build spaceships that can fly on a daily basis. If this is the case, then regular landings will take place. But they will build a moon base from where to stage a Mars mission. What is important about the moon base is that a lot of the flights will be clips flights. In other words, uncrewed flights. And once you've got the first crew up there, you will rotate them at a slow rate. What is also important is that they will start to have to investigate what breeding human beings and, and microgravity and mini gravity is like. How do you have a child in a spaceship? He will never be able to sit, crawl, or walk, but he will be able to fly very quick. In any case, it's, 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 a, it's a problem. So they will build a moon base and they will have regular flights to the moon base. It is claimed that flights to the moon base will be very cheap if you use the same spaceship every time. And this is what SpaceX is trying to achieve. 
And SpaceX is doing a lot of, having a lot of success. They've already flown 100 rockets, of which 60 have been recovered. And they've flown some of their rockets up to seven times already. Now, whether you fly to low Earth orbit or to lunar orbit, there's no big deal because you're still in a vacuum. SpaceX's Falcon Heavy will have the ability to deliver up to about 11 tons to uh, the gateway or to land it on the, the moon. So regular flights will take place. Not necessarily regular crew flights, but the regular flights will take place. Can I just ask, how are the astronauts or the lunar nauts, whatever we're going to call them, going to protect themselves against radiation? And in fact, that goes, the question goes back to the ISS as well. How, what do they do to protect themselves? This is one of the reasons why the gateway and the moon uh, base is so important. The ISS is protected by the Earth's magnetic field. And only very strong eruptions on the sun really worries the people there unless there's warning and they go to a safe station for a very short time. But this cannot happen on the moon. There's no protection against radiation. And conceptually, protection will be by covering the habitat with Earth. But at the moment, practicing with 3D Hunters using equivalent of lunar soil to build an earth mound around a habitat. Sufficiently so that the, uh, the astronauts will be protected. But the radiation is a major problem. And of course, the astronauts sitting in the gateway in the small space station over there is completely exposed, except if they can build a small area that is protected against solar radiation. And in the case of solar radiation, it's only really a problem when there's an eruption on the sun. But cosmic radiation is always there. Johan, you showed us where they intend to land the first one because they want to search for water. But do they have an idea where they want to build the first station on the moon? Yes, yes, yes. In the same area. On the edge of the crater of Shackleton, they will put the first a moon base in that specific area because A, it is always available to sunlight, which gives you power. Secondly, the temperature in that area is a lot more moderate. It's around minus six degrees average compared to the sunny side, which is a hundred and something degrees. And the fact that you always have sunlight means that you have no problem with solar power. So they will be using that area as the first place for a lunar base. Then, of course, they will start investigating the moon. And once they've, they've done that and they've prospected and they decide they want to mine something somewhere, uh, then that will be reconsidered and expanded. There's a number of, of minerals that they want to find on the moon. And the one that's important is helium-3 because they reckon they can find that in great quantities. But be that as it may. Why would helium be so prevalent on the moon? I mean, it's a gas that would escape very easily. Well, yes, but it is held in a chemical composition. I see. The fact that they want to land on that uh, volcano, <laughs> you won't have direct communication with the Earth because it's on the dark side. So that is why they need the gateway, is that correct? No, it's not on the dark side, it's on the edge of the dark side. There will be direct communication. But, but, the gateway's job is a communication relay station in any case. I see it's unfair to ask you to speculate. If Trump is not re-elected, what will happen to this program? It depends on whether it's a Democrat or a Republican that gets in. And of course, Trump is the only Republican and Biden the only Democrat. I have a be belief that the current space race to get people onto the moon is very much there at the moment. And Biden will not easily break away from uh, Artemis III. He may not go any further, but having achieved Artemis III 
and the first woman and the next man on the moon is beating the other guys again. So I have a feeling Biden will carry on if he's elected. Are the Chinese working on a similar program? Absolutely. And I think uh, the Russians also. But uh, the Russians, Roscosmos, is also involved with the planning of the Lunar Gateway. In fact, uh, just about all the uh, space partners of NASA are involved in building bits and pieces of the Gateway. And it's, it's well worthwhile opening that uh, area on Wikipedia, looking at how they plan to put the gateway together. One of the things which I, which I haven't mentioned, which is important, is that the current, current International Space Station is only funded until the end of 2004. Thereafter, they have to decide what they're going to do, and it seems as if they intend deorbiting part of it, the Russians want to take their boat and go somewhere else into their own international, uh, Russian space station. And some people are interested in taking what remains and building it into a space hotel for tourism. So in 2024, the current international space station may stop. And it's important to have the next one kind of up and running by the end of this decade. And the next one will be on the moon. Fascinating. I assume they plan to, at one stage, build a big telescope on the moon because you can survey the, the heavens much better from the moon than you can from the Earth. Absolutely. Both an optical as well as a radio telescope. And if they put the, the, uh, space, the, the moon base at Shackleton, the dark side of the moon is only a couple of kilometers away. Uh, so you can put your telescope and your observatory within about 20 kilometers of your moon base. And you can put your antennas for your uh, radio telescope in the same area. So living on the edge of the uh, day side, it has its advantages. Fascinating. Anybody else? I just want to say thank you very much, Johan. As always, fascinating. I know nothing when I start, and at the end, I think I'm an expert. Thank you so much. There it you go. Absolutely fascinating. <laughs> absolutely fascinating. Thank you. Pleasure, Leticia. Johan, thank you very much. As always, amazing, and thank you for all the research and all the information you have and all the knowledge you have. I'm going to end the meeting now, and goodbye to everybody.